Hello and welcome to Africa Live, where we bring you African and global news from all perspectives. I'm Famida Miller. Now, also coming up in the next half hour. Protecting tomorrow's generation, we take a closer look at the plight of Somali children. And marching on, Libya stunned Togo in World Cup qualifier after safety concerns were adequately addressed. We begin here in Kenya's capital, Nairobi, where the country's president, Uhuru Kenyatta, has asked the International Criminal Court not to set a new trial date for the case against him at The Hague. Uhuru is facing charges of crimes against humanity linked to Kenya's 2007 post-election violence. Now, Kenyatta's trial was originally set to begin in April, but was moved to June after his lawyer cited delayed disclosure of evidence by the prosecution. ICC Chief Prosecutor Fatou Ben Souda had earlier rejected a request from Uhuru's team to push the trial date to January 2014. And that was in order to have sufficient time to investigate the credibility of witnesses. Ben Souda, in response, has revealed the identities of four key witnesses in President Kenyatta's case. Now, still on this issue, the head of the International Criminal Court, ICC, Fatou Ben Souda, says that no international organization has got powers to stop or transfer any of the cases that the ICC is prosecuting. The chief prosecutor was reacting to sentiments by the African Union, where leaders called upon the ICC to consider dropping or at least transferring some cases that the court is pursuing. At the recent summit in Ethiopia, African leaders described the ICC as a racist organization targeting African leaders. However, Ben Sudas dismissed all these accusations, describing them as unfortunate. The ICC chief spoke to CCTV on the sidelines of the New York Forum that's currently taking place in Libreville, Gabon. In those states in Africa that we are investigating and prosecuting, it was at the request of the African states, um, and I always name them. Five out of the eight situations that we are dealing with today were at the request of African states. Is it that we should investigate and, uh, and only charge those people who uh, probably there will be no problem if we charge them, or should we do our work independently and go after those who, who we think bear the greatest responsibility of those crimes. This is what we are doing. We, will, we are investigating in Africa because African states have requested ICC. Now let's turn to a story that's been followed closely around the world. Vigils continue across South Africa to pray for former South African President Nelson Mandela. The anti-apartheid icon remains in hospital for the eighth day this Saturday. Mandela has been undergoing treatment for nearly a week for a recurring lung infection. There was no immediate word Friday on his condition. However, the government said late Thursday Mandela was improving but remained in a serious condition. Meanwhile, South African President Jacob Zuma addressed university students in Soweto, telling them they need to know more about Mandela and their liberation the struggle. The they think Mandela was born in 1994. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that he has gone through many things, including spending 27 years in prison. Get well, Nelson Mandela, get well. Now, for the latest on Mr. Mandela's condition, we cross to Guy Henderson, who's in Pretoria. Guy, we understand it's quiet outside the hospital the Saturday morning. Anything new on your side? Well, really, just um, the amount of tributes which appear to be um, pouring in um, and well wishes arriving outside the hospital. You can probably see behind me what is now a fairly impressive build-up of notes and um, and balloons and even uh, hand prints from um, school children and, and young people who've been visiting. Um, this morning we had, um, just an hour or so ago, a group of young children dressed in karate gear who came to give a, a slight a, a performance, really, for the, for the gathering media here outside the hospital. And last night we had a, a group of musicians who gathered just behind me as well um, to sing um, tribute songs and, and sing well wishes to Nelson Mandela, who is, of course, inside this hospital in Pretoria uh, at the Mediclinic Heart Hospital. Um, some of them, you might think, uh, may be taking advantage for their moment of fame, but there are also some genuine uh, heartfelt tributes uh, pouring in 
for Nelson Mandela. And now this weekend is, of course, of particular significance to South Africans. It is uh, uh, the anniversary of um, a historic moment in South Africa when in on the 16th of June 1976, which will be Sunday, um, about 10,000 or more school children staged a march in the Johannesburg township of Soweto in protest at legislation which made the teaching of the Afrikaans language uh, compulsory in schools. Now, uh, police back in 1976 on that day confronted those school children and opened fire. Um, the uh, death toll has always been disputed and slightly uncertain, but certainly at least eight, 100, you know, over, uh, over 100. Uh, and Nelson Mandela's biographer um, quoted the figure as being as high as 400. Now, uh, Nelson Mandela, of course, wasn't directly involved in those protests. He was locked up in prison on Robben Island. Um, but it did become um, really a, a marker of the resurgence of the domestic struggle against apartheid after those dark years um, from 1964 onwards after Nelson Mandela had been imprisoned. And it did indirectly also lead to a resurgent international campaign for the release of Nelson Mandela himself, although that would take 15 more years to become a reality. Now, Guy, looking at the past week, it's been rather emotional for South Africans. We've even had um, the anniversary of when Mr. Mandela was sentenced to life in prison, and that was this week as well. Can you give us a brief summary of what's happened during the past week? Because it was exactly a week ago that Mr. Mandela was rushed to hospital. Yeah, well, just a few hours before I'm speaking now, exactly one week ago, that first statement came out on the Saturday morning from the presidency to inform people that Nelson Mandela had been sick for several days with a recurrence of this lung infection and that his uh, condition had deteriorated significantly enough uh, that his medical team at his home in Houghton in Johannesburg saw it fit for him to be admitted to hospital um, for what was later revealed to be intensive care. Then there was that 48 hours, very anxious wait, more than 48 hours, um, in which uh, no news came at all. It took until Monday for the presidency to release just a brief statement, but really to say nothing new, simply that Mr Mandela was still in a serious but stable condition. It wasn't until Wednesday until we got any good news at all, which came from a speech in Parliament by President Jacob Zuma, saying that finally uh, Mr Mandela was showing signs of responding to treatment and that he was doing better. After that, we had on Thursday, uh, late on Thursday night, Jacob Zuma managing to sneak past the media here, despite the fact that they were stalking outside every entrance of the hospital, and pay Mr Mandela a visit. After that, uh, we had another brief statement, again saying that Mr Mandela was responding to treatment, but just to remind people that he was still seriously ill. And that pretty much brings us up to speed. We've had no official updates since then. Um, so as it stands in the hospital behind me on Saturday morning, uh, Nelson Mandela is in a stable condition. He is responding to treatment, but he remains a very unwell man. Now, Guy, just before we wrap up, this isn't Mr. Mandela's first stay in hospital and for quite a number of days. And in the past, there have been some difficulty with government communication. However, this time round, there seems to be some praise for the South African government. What has it been like trying to track the story with limited information coming out? Well, it, it is in stark contrast to how it was back in December and before that. Um, I think this uh, growing trust has built up on both sides, really. Um, on the one hand, uh, journalists had in the past accused the government of uh, deliberately misleading people, um, and the government on their, part, on, their, on their side had always argued that, well, the medical details of a patient were private and confidential. Um, I think now there is this increasing respect on both sides of both of those arguments, and it has led to, um, A, a tightening up of information on the government side, um, maybe slightly less information, but it's only coming from one source now. Um, so everybody here knows that when you need information, um, when you're looking for an update, you phone the presidential spokesman, spokesman Mac Maharaj. Um, the government on its part has made an, a, a, an increasing effort um, to provide these regular updates almost on a daily basis, just to keep a very anxious public uh, here in South Africa and across the world informed. Often, uh, th there's not really any update, but it's almost just a courtesy call um, just briefly updating people, um, at least to allay fears that his, that his condition might have deteriorated. So there has been a real difference in covering this story just in the last six months or so. Um, and that, that build-up of, of trust has, um, I think, regained itself after a period when, frankly, uh, journalists weren't quite sure what to believe from, from what was coming out from the presidency.
All right, Guy Henderson there, thank you very much, giving us the latest update from outside the Pretoria Hospital where Nelson Mandela is being treated. It's time now for a quick break, but when we come back... Queuing for loaves, Egyptian government ponders over how to address scarcity of bread. And protecting tomorrow's generation, we take a closer look at the plight of Somali children. Breaking news, global trends. CCTV News brings you stories with the different aspects of Africa in the international content. With our reporters across Africa and all over the world, we'll tell you about the real Africa and how it impacts the world. Africa Live, every day, only on CCTV News. We follow the latest trends in global politics, economics, culture and sport and how Africa fits into the global picture. You decide what's important. We need some trade and justice. Africa's future will be determined by Africa. For women's equal opportunity for a better life. We have to change something and it's not the, the, the outsiders. Talk Africa, a new voice for the world. Welcome back. Turning to North Africa now, Egypt is currently facing a bread shortage. Situations become so dire that many have killed to get a loaf. However, this is not a new problem. Egyptians have faced similar difficulties since the 1970s. CCTV's Yasser Hakim takes a look at the situation and just how the current Egyptian leadership is trying to solve it. People queuing in long lines in front of bakeries, fighting and in some cases killing over a loaf of bread has been a recurring nightmare for Egypt's governments. Bread is a cheap, vital ingredient of any Egyptian meal, which is why it has become a political force, not just an item on the menu. Because of this three cent piece of bread, the late president Anwar Sadat was nearly toppled because he wanted to cut the subsidies on it. Even the revolution against Mubarak, the main three principles were bread, freedom and social justice. Bread came first. Now there are signs of discontent within the public as the government struggles to sustain subsidies to provide bread at an affordable price to the 84 million Egyptians. Bread makes Egypt the largest import of wheat in the world at 9 million tons per year, but the economic recession in the last two years has restricted funding for wheat imports. The security vacuum has also allowed for unprecedented smuggling of subsidized wheat and flour into the black market. So the government is subsidizing bread, but there is still shortage. To avoid suffering the same fate that befell previous governments, the ruling Freedom and Justice Party opted to use its resources to deliver bread to homes of the impoverished. A move, though commendable, elicited mixed reaction from the public. It is a sign of failure by the government that the Muslim Brotherhood had to resort to such tactics used by the former leadership. It's only aimed at getting votes for elections and not helping the people. Delivering bread to the people is a wonderful idea and shows that they care for us. They know our suffering and are doing something about it. The opposition never took such steps to help the poor. In the meantime, the government has announced a raft of incentives for farmers to grow more wheat and reduce importing, as well as a plan to restructure the subsidy system and combat smuggling. Experts say it will take time, but the leadership knows time is not a luxury when it comes to bread. This is Yasser Hakim for CCTV, Cairo. Now to discuss this further, we're joined live by Yasser Hakim who is in Cairo. Yasser, we see bread is not just a food item, but it's also become an issue of political debate. Just how important is bread and its industry to Egyptians? Uh, bread uh, is so important that uh, the word bread in Egyptian, it's different than the word bread in Arabic. It means life. Egyptians, when they talk about bread, they don't say, give me a loaf of bread. They, they say, give me a loaf of life. 
So that's how important it is. Egyptians um, import around 19 million tons per year of wheat for bread, and that's the largest in the world. And uh, a, a government uh, authority last uh, year, in last June, have made this uh, some kind of rego recording, and it has recorded that in one week, uh, last June, Egyptians uh, consumed three billion loaves of bread just in one week. So that's how important it is for Egyptians. There was there, there is an annual uh, festival called the Wheat Festival for bread every year, where uh, Egyptians have a public holiday to celebrate the wheat production for bread. So that's how important bread is for Egyptians. Now the scarcity, obviously, a problem, and you mentioned in your report that the government has embarked on a series of plans to tackle the bread shortage, incentives for farmers, as well as combating smuggling of subsidized flour. Can you give us more details about these plans? Yes, uh, just to throw in a number, Egypt imports around 10 million tons out of the 20 that's consumed. This costs the Egyptian government $3.5 billion, a government that is facing a huge budget deficit. So the incentives for farmers to grow more in Egypt so that in four years the government hopes that it does not need to import at all. It is uh, buying the crops from the local farmers at international prices and then it's selling it to the public at subsidized prices. So this way it is encouraging the farmers to change their crop into wheat for, for bread. Uh, that's concerning the, con the, the production, it wants to produce more. Concerning smuggling, uh, the bakeries, uh, they take the subsidized flour and the wheat and they are supposed to sell it uh, as bread at a low price. But what is happening is that they take it from the government as subsidized uh, price and then they sell it at international price for for uh, others uh, such as uh, cakes or uh, for industries uh, for uh, expensive bread so the government has uh, given smart cards to the bakeries with a quota of around 100 uh, uh, kilograms of, of flour and they record how many loaves of bread are out are produced are sell to the public at the subsidized price uh, it's around 1,100 per 100 uh, uh, kilograms of, of flour. And this way it's controlling the black market. And if anyone sells less than 1,100 loaves of bread, then he has to pay the difference in international prices or he could lose risking his license. He could risk losing his, li his license. Then there's the storing problem. There's a problem in storing in Egypt. They're trying to solve this problem to get more uh, storage capabilities. And finally, and that's the most important part, is trying to limit consumption of Egyptians. And this was the, the difficult part. They said that they will only, the government will only subsidize three loaves of bread per person every day. Egyptians consume five to six loaves of bread. Uh, any more consumption will be according to international prices. Uh, the people, when they heard about that two months ago, there was huge riots, huge demonstrations, and the government decided to postpone this uh, subsidized uh, quota for Egyptians uh, until an indefinite time to see to, to avoid unrest in the streets. So those are mainly the, the, the plan by the government in the next few years. All right, thanks very much. We'll leave it there. Yasser Kim live in Cairo, giving us some idea of government intervention in the bread industry. Now, to the Horn of Africa, where many Somali children remain out of school and are instead helping their families in the struggle to put food on the table. An estimated 10.5 million children worldwide are working in hazardous and often slave-like conditions. According to the International Labour Organization, around 6.5 million child laborers are aged between 5 and 14 years. CCTV's Mohamed Moge takes a closer look at the situation in Somalia. Somalia's long conflict had heavy toll on children. They were killed and maimed, while others were recruited into armed militia. Hundreds of orphan children now live in the streets of Mogadishu, taking shelter in abandoned buildings and often abused drugs. Last year, CCTV featured 13 years old Amina Ali, who is a mother of one, caught between fending for a two months old baby in a war to nation and fighting the stigma of divorce. Amina is, however, not the only teen mother struggling to make ends meet. Many others have been caught in physical and sexual violence while working in abusive conditions. I've come across girls that were living on the streets. I've come across girls that have been raped on numerous occasions. I've come across girls that have escaped being a sex slave. Girls that were forcibly married to Al-Shabaab militants. 
Children in Somalia are faced with a difficult task of fending for themselves. One would see children working hard to clean vehicles while others are touts. I work in this garage. I help the mechanic as he fixes the engine. When I'm older, I'll be able to fix vehicles on my own. I run errands in this garage. I dropped out of school when my mother left for Saudi Arabia. I have an elder sister who's at home. I take home whatever I earn from what I do here. The transition of federal administration had signed with the United Nations an agreement to stop the recruitment of child soldiers, as well as killing and maiming of children in all combat confrontations. Somalia has since 2007 been in the United Nations list of countries that recruit children for combat. Children in this country bore the brunt of a long conflict. Many have been isolated from their parents and were later recruited into armed militia. Many others today do hard labor to fend for themselves and their siblings. Mohammed Hirmogi, CCTV, Mogadishu.